we're gonna we're gonna max this place out. Come on, semester. Well, you know, Boulder's a real science of place. You know, with all the national labs and this, and then there's a lot of engineering and uh, you know all this stuff scattered around. It's, uh, <laughs> students, uh, literally from every continent in the world except Antarctica, okay? Uh, huh? We're working on, we're recruiting penguins. Um, and, um, uh, and 19 lecturers, it's spread over four weeks. This is the fourth week of Cassie. Uh, I've done a lot of lectures, I am very tired. Uh, Cassie started in 1984. Uh, when I was a student, there was no summer school for graduate students in America. We had to go to Europe. And it started in 84, it came to Boulder in 1989, and it's been here ever since. And the way it works is that there's an external board that chooses the scientific organizers. We have a member of the external board here, uh, uh, Tom Lacan, someplace in the room, and then uh, one of the organizers, uh, Ian Lowe, is here. And these guys make up the program. So every year it's a different program, uh, it's a different group of people's friends, and it's completely, you know, it changes from year to year, which keeps us very young and vital and whatnot. Uh, Cassie is famous, okay? It is the outstanding summer program in elementary particle theory in the world, full stop, okay? I go places, people walk up to me and say, I was here in 1995, I remember you, and I say, oh, that's nice. People, okay, if you're a teacher, you know how much that's the same. <laughs> and um, past students and lecturers here uh, are basically the leaders in our field. And, um, we are, we are so lucky to have him in Boulder, okay? So that's Cassie. Uh, so our speaker tonight is uh, Nima Arkhamihane. Uh, when, when I do these introductions, I write people and I say, please send me a thumbnail biography because it's easier than looking people up. And uh, I admire what he sent me. He said that he was a theoretical physicist with broad interest in fundamental physics and cosmology, which is absolutely true. I would not have the best to write that as a description. Okay, um, it's a wonderful thing, but I have to say also, so we go in the Monday things. He got his PhD from Berkeley in 97, and he's a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. And he is certainly one of the deep and important people of our field, so we're very happy to have him. And the title of his talk, it's, a, it's like the way he describes himself, uh, The Future of Fundamental Physics. So, take it away. Well, it's really a fantastic, fantastic pleasure to be in this uh, very, very beautiful place and uh, um, uh, to be giving this uh, lecture on this modest subject on uh, the future of our, uh, uh, depending on how you start, 2,000 or 400 year quest uh, to um, uh, more deeply understand the fundamental laws of nature. And um, uh, it's actually, an, uh, it's, it's a quite appropriate time uh, to be talking about this uh, subject. Um, because on the one hand, uh, especially through the tremendous developments that took place in the 20th century that uh, I will spend the first part of the lecture telling you more about, we have an incredible theoretical foundation on which uh, uh, to build 
uh, a deeper understanding of what the fundamental laws of nature are. We have an absolutely spectacular understanding of, uh, the, of, uh, of a humongous, vast diversity of phenomenon in nature, stretching over a gargantuan uh, a span of uh, length scales from distances a thousand times smaller than the nucleus of the atom all the way out to the uh, uh, size of the observable universe. We have an incredible uh, uh, theoretical foundation supported by lots of phenomenal experimental tests. So we know what we're doing. Okay? We're not uh, foundering uh, at some uh, zeroth order. And that just puts into higher relief uh, how uh, strange and remarkable it is that these very principles, the very uh, foundations on which this tremendous success are, have been built, are now under question. Uh, this doesn't happen all the time in the history of the development of physics or any science. Mostly, the development of uh, any subject is incremental, and that's proper and good. It's a, respect, it's a, it's a sign of how much we understand things. Okay? Um, not every moment is ripe for revolution, nor should it be. Uh, it's only a few moments in the history of development of a subject where you've arrived at a point where something big has got to give, and the next step uh, seems to have a need to be more revolutionary than things that came before it. We are at a period like that around 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, as we departed from the classical worldview of Newton and Maxwell and their uh, uh, successors to the uh, worldview given to us by Einstein and the developers of quantum mechanics, so the pictures of space-time, relativity, and quantum mechanics. And it looks like we're at a similar juncture today. Okay? So that's why I can give an interesting talk uh, about the future. You should always be skeptical about people talking about uh, the future because... Uh, uh, of course, we don't know exactly what, it's, what, it, what, what it is. Um, uh, but uh, we're at a place where I can tell you what these great successes are and at least define what these really big questions are that are going to drive the development of fundamental physics in the 21st century. Okay? And this is, uh, uh, it, it's going to be a, a, a broad brush um, uh, picture, um, but let me first uh, at least set up uh, how the next... Uh, um, uh, how the rest of the talk is going to be organized. Uh, so uh, at, at a very zero order, we can... Is there a laser pointer, by the way? Okay, thanks. At some... Uh, I can jump. No. Uh, uh, this slogan uh, encapsulates... Uh, uh, the really great thing that we discovered in the 20th century. In a sense, it's a triumph, the intellectual triumph of the 20th century. We have these revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics. And uh, with both of these principles, we understand that at some very broad brush, zeroth rough order, the structure of the laws that we see in the universe at long distances, what we see uh, that we've proven in experiment, is largely inevitable. Okay? That's a, an amazing statement. And, um, but the central dramas of the 21st century are that these very principles uh, are, are in question. Uh, the pictures of relativity, space-time, and of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanics um, uh, seem to lead us to paradoxes. So we think that space-time is, is doomed, it's got to be replaced by some more uh, primitive ideas, and that, that has to do with issues uh, 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 related ultimately to uh, gravity and quantum mechanics together. It's even conceivable, I probably won't have time to talk about this in any detail, but there, that we're starting to see limitations of the framework of quantum mechanics when we try to figure out how to apply the principles of quantum mechanics to talk about the entire universe. So, so the very theoretical foundations are, uh, are in question. And closer to home, while we can understand things about the world Tremendous things about, uh, about the world. We have such a precise, exquisite understanding of things that we can predict in various uh, situations. Uh, uh, there's agreements between theory and experiment to 12 decimal places. Uh, there are very simple questions about the world that we have no good answer to. Okay, and this is a hallmark of, uh, of, uh, of being in a, in, a, in a healthy crisis in the physics where there are extremely simple questions that we have no good answers to. And one very simple question is, why is the universe big? It's one of the most basic facts about the world, that it's big even though it's made out of small things. And the fundamental laws are best described in very small scales. Why is the universe big? Why is there a macroscopic universe? You would think we'd have a good answer uh, to a question like that. We have a lousy answer to that question. And both the underlying foundations and the presence of this big universe together are indicating that we're missing something very big. 
And that's what I want to tell you about. In this talk, I want to tell you first uh, why we think we understand things so spectacularly well, and secondly, why that the very things that are going so well have got to be uh, pulled out from under us and somehow replaced with, with something else. And that's the, that's the creative tension that we find ourselves in. Very similar sort of creative tension that people found themselves in, as I said, a little over 100 years ago, where they also had the clock clockwork Newtonian universe working spectacularly well, um, but was pulled out uh, from under them and, and uh, uh, replaced with more radical ideas. All right, so let's go with the first part, which is a, a, a redux of the, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, the two big revolutions that we started the 20th century with were these principles of uh, uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics. Special relativity told us ultimately that time and space were not as separate as they seemed and they could be mixed with each other. Uh, they, uh, uh, what, what one person might uh, conceive of as just a separation of two points in space, another observer moving at some finite velocity could think of as a separation in both space and time. So we could mix space and time with each other and there's the, there's the more unified picture of space time uh, that emerged. There's the even more radical and strange um, laws of quantum mechanics that told us that, uh, that, that we couldn't predict with certainty uh, the outcome of uh, future experiments, even if we knew everything about initial uh, conditions. There are famous things like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that put fundamental limitations on, on, on what we could know uh, about the world, a humongous uh, change from the Newtonian worldview. <coughs> and it turns out that both of these things are true and that there's a very constrained, uh, it's almost impossible for both of these things to be true at the same time. Okay? Um, and, uh, and there is a theoretical structure that people discovered um, uh, after all these things were sort of set by the 1930s, and most of the rest of the 20th century was realizing how to make these principles work together. So first, purely theoretically, in imaginary, any imaginary universe that's compatible with both of these principles, what could the laws possibly look like? Uh, that general framework is known as quantum field theory. So this is the set of principles that let us talk about worlds that are compatible with the broad principles of relativity and quantum mechanics. And then much of the rest of the 20th century was spent finding a very specific quantum field theory that describes the elementary particles and interactions that we know of in our world. Okay, and I'll say a tiny bit about that, but since my purpose in this talk today is a little bit more structural, uh, uh, I, I, I won't uh, go over it in, uh, in a lot of detail. But, um, but here's at least at broad brush what, what, what we learned. We learned that everything uh, in the world is made out of particles, little elementary particles, and the elementary particles interact with each other. Okay? Um, all the interactions we know, the forces, gravity, electromagnetism, everything else, all the complexity of the world that we see around us is ultimately uh, comes down to elementary particles that interact in a very simple way, in the simplest possible way. So, for example, two electrons can interact with a photon. Okay? Uh, that interaction, this picture means that there's an interaction between an electron, a photon, another electron, and drawing it like this indicates that it takes place at one point in space and time. Okay? So the interactions, we say, are local in space and time. Okay? They, 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 they take place at points in, in, in space and time. Now, that's the simplest possible interaction you could imagine between three things. You can't really imagine an interaction between two things. That's, that just means you have a particle moving along. Maybe it changes its name, but nothing is changing. Okay? The only, the first interaction that you can think of is with three things coming together. That's the simplest possible interaction. And it turns out the simplest possible interactions, that's the interaction between electrons and a photon. There's an analogous interaction between electrons and particles called gravitons. And it's these interactions that when you concatenate, you, you make them happen over and over and over again, you put them together in every possible way, they give rise to all the phenomenon that we see in nature around us. So when electrons are spinning around uh, protons in, the, uh, in, in an atom, it's this, this interaction of a photon going back and forth, back and forth between the electron and the proton constantly, all the time. Okay? So, uh, so we can put these simple little Lego building blocks together and make all the complicated interactions in the world around us. We have elementary particles interacting in the simplest possible way. Now those interactions, the strong, uh, those interactions, electromagnetism and gravity, are familiar and they were known for people for, uh, for centuries. In the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, we discovered other kinds of less familiar interactions. 
There are the so-called strong interactions, which are the first manifestation was what holds protons together inside the nucleus of an atom, even though they're electrically charged and they want to repel each other. Something is holding them together in the nuclei of atoms like helium, where there's two protons sitting there. Um, and uh, there's something else called the weak interactions, which is responsible for radioactivity. So if you take a, a neutron, one of the constituents of the nucleus of the atom, if you take the neutron in empty space and you wait 15 minutes, it'll disintegrate. It'll decay to a proton, an, an electron, something called an anti-electron neutrino. And what's ultimately responsible for that disintegration is a new kind of, of interaction. They're called weak interactions because you have this teeny tiny elementary particle, the neutron, which nonetheless lives for 15 whole minutes before it decays. What's making it decay is an incredibly weak thing if it uh, lets it live for so, so, so long compared to all the sort of microscopic, teeny tiny natural timescales associated with it. Anyway, on the surface, these seem radically different than electromagnetism and gravity. But when we understood things more deeply, we understood they're actually fundamentally the same. So the strong interactions, the protons and neutrons, are made up actually out of particles called quarks. They're held together inside the nuclei of atom by things called gluons. And ultimately, same stick figure interactions. Electrons and, uh, and uh, neutrinos interact with other kinds of particles that are close cousins of the photons. They're called W bosons and Z bosons. And uh, it's the same basic stick figure interactions. What the difference is, for example, is that the photon is a, is a massless particle. It doesn't have any mass. It moves around at the speed of light. And, uh, and, and because it's massless, uh, it, it, if I take an electron here, an electron really far away, uh, one way of thinking about what this, uh, what this, what this picture means is that, is that the presence of these two electrons excites uh, due to the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's possible to excite out of the vacuum a photon momentarily, because, uh, and then its presence causes the uh, electrons to repel each other. Okay? But because the photon is massless, it doesn't cost too much energy to do that. Okay? And if I make the separation bigger and bigger, I can just make the frequency of the photon smaller and smaller, its wavelength longer and longer, and there will still be a force there. It goes down like the inverse square law, it gets weaker, but it's still there, and you can measure it even at very, very long distances. On the other hand, if the particle has a mass, then there's a certain minimum amount of energy just to pop it out. There's, no matter what you do, E equals mc squared, and the energy can never get smaller than that mc squared. So if you go to big distances, it's harder and harder and harder uh, to uh, exploit the uncertainty principle to make it appear out of the vacuum. And so the long distance force that you get is minuscule. Okay? That's why we uh, had to we build these giant particle accelerators. We go to very high energies uh, in order to probe very short distances. And it's only at very short distances that this fundamental similarity between all of these uh, interactions and all of these, uh, um, uh, everything that we see in nature really becomes apparent. So uh, due to the fact that these W particles have a mass, the range of this uh, of this weak force is short. It's around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. That's around 100 times smaller than the nucleus of the atom, okay? which is in turn around a million times smaller than the atom itself. Right? So while on the face of it, when we are stuck out here for thousands of years as human beings, you know, meters big, <laughs> then we do experiments to go to shorter and shorter and shorter scales, it took all these thousands of years when we, we finally could go to distances, or not just the atom, the nucleus of the atom, a hundred times smaller than the nucleus of the atom, we build these giant particle accelerators uh, uh, in order to probe uh, the laws of nature down there. And only finally there do we see the fundamental similarity between all of these interactions. And that's why we do it. Okay? That's uh, the, the, the main reason for building these huge machines. We collide particles with very, very high energy um, uh, because in order to probe things at very, very short distances, by the uncertainty principle, again, you need incredibly high energies. And we do it because it's at very high energies and short distances that the basic uh, uh, simplicity and unity of the laws of nature manifest themselves. All right, now, there's another feature uh, associated with this uh, picture, um, uh, so to, with the elementary particles that we know. The particles have, uh, have various properties. For example, you know electrons, maybe they have a charge, uh, they have mass. There's another property that's slightly less familiar if you're not a physicist. The particles have an intrinsic kind of spin. You can think of the electron, for example, as a little top, uh, and it spins around. And, uh, and, and 
Uh, many things in quantum mechanics are quantized, um, and, and the amount of spin that a particle can have is one of them. Okay? So particles, just according to the usual rules of quantum mechanics, can spin, they have, can have some angular momentum, this intrinsic angular momentum, that comes quantized in units of the, of the fundamental constant of quantum mechanics, the Planck's constant. You can have a spin that's zero, one half, one, three halves, two, five halves, three. You can have any multiple of one half times Planck's constant. And uh, those are the allowed possible values of spin. Now, the particles that we know seem to have relatively simple values of these spins. The electrons have spin a half. Photons have spin one. Gravitons have spin two. Ws have spin one. Okay? In our list of elementary particles, we don't have any that have spin 77 halves, even though it's perfectly allowed by the general principles of quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so the particles that we see are extremely simple. Okay? Uh, I just gave you some examples. All that we've seen for the familiar particles are particles of spin a half, like electrons, particles of spin one, like photons and W particles, uh, and particles of, uh, and a particle of spin two, the graviton. Now, this is the thing which, in a more conventional uh, 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 public talk, you would spend a long time talking about is the very the specific menu of elementary particles and interactions that we've seen. Uh, there's this picture that was completed by the 1970s known as the standard model of particle physics. Uh, tells us we have, uh, we have particles like electrons and photons, electrons, neutrinos, and Ws, quarks and gluons, and everything interacts with gravity. And it's just we have a relatively small menu of particles of that form. Okay? Some of them are familiar, like electrons, and maybe you know about up and down quarks inside protons and neutrons. Some of them may be less familiar, like the tau particle or the top quark. But they're all basically the same thing. There's a very specific menu, and this is just that you don't even need to know what any of this means. This is just a way of assigning all of these basic interactions, all these basic three particle interactions, which we again put together in every possible way to uh, give rise to all the complexity of all the rest of the phenomenon that we see in nature. So there's a, there's a kind of a, there's a very simple zeroth order question that you could ask. Why did things turn out to be so relatively simple? And there are two aspects to this. I, I told you that, uh, that, the, that the fundamental interaction involved three particles coming together. Right? Well, well, why is that? Why was the most basic interaction just A, B, and C? Why don't we have fundamental interactions that look like 12 particles coming together at a point? I don't know if that's 12 of them there, but how, whatever it is. Okay? Um, if we had fundamental interactions like that too, that would suck. Okay? Um, because it would mean that we can't explain the complexity of the world from a simple starting point, right? After all, the sort of beauty here is that when 12 particles come together and interact, we can break it up into these basic, more elementary three particle interactions. If there was a fundamental 12 particle interaction that says when these three particles come in at 17 degrees, they have to go out at 47 degrees, well, then we have much less that we could explain about the world. That would suck. Okay? So are we lucky? That doesn't seem to be that way, right? We don't seem to have these fundamental 12 particle interactions. We have only three particle interactions. That's very interesting. And secondly, why do we have such a tiny menu of spins? We're allowed to have spin 99 halves. Why don't we have it? Why is it all we have uh, this very, very small selection of particles? Now, in, uh, in a talk that's twice as long as this one, uh, which you will hopefully not hear, <laughs> um, uh, I could actually explain this in a little bit more detail, but, uh, but uh, you're going to have to take my word for it, um, uh, at least for the remainder of this talk as planned. Uh, and this is one of the truly amazing things that we discovered in theoretical physics in the last 40 years, um, uh, is that... Uh, we, we understand this. We understand why uh, the answer to both of these two, two questions. And it has everything to do with relativity and quantum mechanics together. In fact, if we only have the laws of relativity, you could imagine bazillions of different kinds of worlds. Zillions and zillions of different kinds of worlds. If you only have the laws of quantum mechanics, similarly, gargantuan number of vastly different possibilities. But you say both things together, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden our hands are almost completely tied. And there's almost nothing we can do. The way I like to say it is if you imagine handing these broad laws of, of space-time and quantum mechanics to a bunch of sufficiently competent theoretical physicists, so that would not include me, 
Uh, but if you imagine giving it to them and putting them in a room and closing the windows so they couldn't see the world outside. This is always slightly counterfactual because they're in a room which is part of the world and so on, but never mind. Okay, So, so uh, they don't get to see the world outside. You just give them the rules and you say, go. Your job is to invent theories that are compatible with relativity and quantum mechanics. And that's it. Now, they would look at it and say, relativity, that's easy. I know to do that. Quantum mechanics I'd say, really? I have to make a theory compatible with both? OK, if you say so, right? And then if it was me, I would work on it very hard for a week. And I'd come back and I'd say, can't be done. Sorry, uh, just cannot be done. Let me give you a hint for why it seems very hard. Remember I told you that relativity tells you that time and space can be mixed with each other. Okay, So time is not as special as it seems in the Newtonian picture of the world. Okay, So you have to treat time and space on a more equal footing when you think about relativity. Quantum mechanics changed everything about what physics was about, but the one thing it didn't change was the primality of time. <laughs> Time is very important. So if you're a quantum mechanician, you have to say, give me the initial state. Maybe it's a wave function or something, but give it to me. And then I can predict what happens in the future. Or I can predict probabilities in the future. But time, 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 time. Time matters a lot if you're a quantum mechanician. Time matters much less, or it has to be treated in a much more equal footing if you like relativity. So both things together, they don't speak the same language on the face of it. Okay. And so that's why I would give up. I would try a few dumb things. They wouldn't work. And I would say, you're tricking me. I can't give up. But other people, they would sit there in the room. You would bring them food, graduate students, OK? Uh, <laughs> not, not graduate students as food, OK? <laughs> that's not how we do things in Princeton. Uh, hopefully nowhere. Uh, but eventually, they would discover something truly amazing. They would come back and say, we figured it out. And actually, uh, it looks impossible, but uh, so long as the, the underlying laws are compatible with both relativity and quantum mechanics, then this is what the world should look like at long distances. We can't tell you precisely what, but this is on a, on a broad brush what it has to look like. Whatever the underlying laws are, whatever the ultimate theory is, we don't know what it is, but if it's con compatible with these principles at long enough distances, you will discover that you have elementary particles. And their dominant interactions are three things coming together. Not four or 17 or 12, but three. Okay. And secondly, they say the only spins that are allowed, at first we thought it was impossible, but then we look carefully and it turns out there's a tiny set that can make it. And here's what they are. You can have particles of spin zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. And then they would tell you, that spin two guy is really interesting. There can only be one of them. You can't have two or three. You can only have one. And it does something really interesting. If you have uh, other massive things lying around, it, it acts on these massive particles, and it makes them go around in orbits. It's gravity, right? They've never looked out the window. They don't know there's apples falling. Uh, they don't know any of this. Uh, but they discover from pure thought and, of course, these crazy principles of relativity and quantum mechanics that were ultimately handed to us by the, by, by the hard work of experimentally looking at the world. But once you know those principles, after that, from pure thought, you discover all of uh, gravity. In fact, not just Newtonian gravity, but the entire structure of Einstein's theory of general relativity is, in fact, completely fixed by, uh, by the principles of special relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay? That's an amazing thing. Then they tell you this three halves is allowed. That's also weird. You can, you can have at most eight of them. Okay? You can have one, two, we can't have set, you, you can't have, uh, uh, eleven. You can have at most eight of them. That's, that's interesting. Then these one, you can have a bunch of the one guys. You can, uh, you can have a bunch of these, but they have very peculiar and, and, uh, fixed kind of interactions. You can have a bunch of the, of the half guys. You can have any number of the zero guys. They're a dime a dozen. Okay? That's what they would tell you. Okay. Now, I've put in red here the ones, in black, the, the, the ones that we've seen, right? So on general grounds, uh, and so to note, the only freedom we now have is to choose the menu and to choose the strength of those interactions when three points come together. That's it, okay? That's a humongous reduction uh, compared to what we uh, had previously. Just to give you an example, you know, if you're a Newton, you choose to say that the force between planets follows an inverse square law, 1 over r squared. Why did you choose 1 over r squared? Why wasn't it 1 over r to the 2.1? Or 1 over r to the, you know, 14.774, okay? No reason. It would have worked perfectly just on general principles of his theory. You could choose any number there. He chose 1 over r squared because that's what agrees with the data. 
Okay? Today we know it cannot be anything other than 1 over r squared. Okay? Amongst many, many other things. Okay? So it's a huge reduction. In fact, the only freedom we have is choosing this menu. We don't even get a menu for that because there's only one of them. You choose a menu of how many of these, how many of those, how many of those, and, uh, and the strength of the interactions, and we're done. Okay. Now, what I've told you makes it sound like an extremely pat story. <laughs> okay? um, but uh, if you're paying any attention to a particle physics, you'll know there's this fantastic discovery uh, on July 4th, uh, uh, 2012, of the Higgs particle. Okay? So why are physicists so excited about the Higgs? What's the story? How does the Higgs fit into this, uh, fit into this story? Well, there was a little caveat, which I didn't mention before in this uh, uh, here. And the caveat is you have to assume that all these particles have zero mass. They're massless. Okay? I say that sounds like a terrible caveat because uh, the electron has a mass. All the particles that we care about practically, maybe photons and gravitons don't have mass, but everything else is uh, massive. So what are you talking about? Well, remember, we've already seen that to really see what's going on with the laws of nature, we are going to very short distances, very, very high energies. And so it's a very good idea as a first approximation to imagine that you're on incredibly high energies, such high energies that surely you can neglect the masses of the particles compared to the energies involved. Okay? So we're taking these particles and we're smashing them together at energies that are gargantuan compared to the mc squared that they have. And you would think it's a very good approximation to neglect the masses in that, uh, in that limit. And so you were trying to see what the laws look like in the most fundamental state at very, very high energies. And then in that approximation, this is the story we have, this very rigid story we have. So we think we're almost done. We're almost done. Now we just have to uh, take the particles that we see that do have a mass and figure out, you know, then that'll, this, what we just talked about as a first approximation to the, uh, to the real story will be very simple to a workout. But it's not that simple to work out. <laughs> because of this fascinating difference uh, between massless particles and, uh, and, uh, and massive particles when the particles have a spin. So let's take an example of this W boson, W particle that I talked about, that has spin 1. It's a massive particle and has spin 1. Now, a massive particle of spin 1 has sort of three ways in which it can spin. If you imagine that it's a top, it has sort of basically three degrees of freedom um, and uh, the way you can see that is no matter how fast it's moving in whichever direction it's spinning in, you can always run with it to move to a frame where it's at rest. If it's at rest, you have a W and it's spinning up this way. If you just tilt your head, you could imagine it spinning this way. You can imagine it spinning in all the possible three directions. So a massive particle with spin has three degrees of freedom. However, a massless particle with spin, like a photon, has only two degrees of freedom. It can only spin in two directions. And the reason is that we can't run the argument that, that we just ran. Because the photon moves at the speed of light, I can't catch up with it. I can't go to a frame where it's at rest and then do this business of tilting my head to see that it could uh, spin in every possible direction. So in fact, a massless spin one particle has two degrees of freedom, while the massive spin one particle has three. Okay? Two is not equal to three. This is really interesting because it means there's a strange discontinuous difference between massive and massless. So from our previous uh, logic, what we wanted to do is say, well, we'll go to really high energies. We can neglect the masses of the particle. Everything is great. And then all that stuff is totally fixed by this uh, very rigid structure. But we can't just ignore it willy-nilly because there's extra stuff there. There's one extra degree of freedom associated with these, uh, with these uh, particles. Uh, when, when they have a spin. So we have to do an interesting game where we have to take these massive objects, we have to take the degrees of freedom that these massive objects are comprised of, and figure out, as we go to really high energies, how they reassemble into the underlying massless objects uh, whose interactions we understand perfectly. Okay? And it turns out that if we just took everything we knew about particle physics before July 4th, 2012, before we'd seen the Higgs particle, that it was impossible to do that, just from simple counting. Okay? Uh, you would just see that you simply did not have enough degrees of freedom in order to be able to reassemble all of the degrees of freedom of these massive spin one particles into the legitimate allowed degrees of freedom of the massless ones that we just talked about a moment ago. There was something missing. 
Now, what can you do when there is something missing? Uh, you can go, if you're a theoretical physicist, you go, you say there's incredibly constrained rules, and you go see what can nature do compatible with those rules. We've just figured out what it can do compatible with those rules. And you'll notice in this menu, there are some things that were in red. <laughs> the things that were in red were particles that we had not seen before. Okay? So we had not seen elementary particles of spin zero, Still not seen elementary particles of spin three halves, but these are things nature can do compatible with its general principles. We have not yet seen it do. And so when you're confronted with a puzzle, you can ask, is there an opportunity there? Maybe nature is exploiting something that we didn't know that it was exploiting before. Okay? The amazing thing about the Higgs is all it took was precisely one extra particle. That's all. All he needed was exactly one extra particle, and that was all that was needed in order to reassemble all of the degrees of low energy, long distance degrees of freedom of massive particles, and have them continuously, seamlessly melt into the massless degrees of freedom that are consistently interacting in the way that I uh, specified at very high energies. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? Now, um, this is, uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a, 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 a long time on the on the, the physics that's going on with the Large Hadron Collider in this talk. Uh, the near future of fundamental physics for the next uh, five, ten years is going to be entirely dominated by what we learn from the LHC, but that makes it especially silly to speculate about in a public talk because we're going to know something for a fact uh, on the time scale of this summer, year from now, two or three years from now, and so this is really something experimentally uh, 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 to watch. Um, but uh, this is, it's an aerial picture of uh, the area outside, uh, uh, outside Geneva. Of course, you don't see this big red circle on the ground. Uh, but, uh, but far underground, uh, there's, a, there's a tunnel, and protons are circulated one way and the other way around the tunnel, and they collide with each other with energies roughly 10,000 times the mc squared of the protons themselves. The velocities they have are 0.999999, that's 79 times the speed of light. And all of this is done to allow us to probe physics at distances a thousand times smaller than the nucleus of the atom around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Okay, and, and this was heroically done uh, to discover, amongst others, uh, discovered uh, uh, a number of uh, other things, but from the point of view of our story, uh, the Higgs particle was discovered in July 4th. And it's obviously a triumph for experiment, but it's also a triumph for theory, okay? because, uh, because there are not many things that it could be, and we finally saw nature do something compatible with general principles uh, that it had not done before. And physics works. We got to turn that red circle into a black circle. Okay? And that's what's interesting about the Higgs. It's not just hype. Okay? The Higgs is the first really new particle that we've seen in, well, 50 years. I don't know how to count exactly. It's really the first time that we've seen something that, uh, that wasn't lying around already. We'd seen electrons, we'd seen all these other, all these other things uh, uh, we, 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 we'd seen before, but it's the first time we've seen an elementary particle of spin zero. Okay, so that's the that's the that's uh, the conclusion of the first part. Um, uh, and what I hope you've seen from here is that these two big revolutions, relativity and quantum mechanics, have put us in a tremendous straitjacket as theorists. Okay, it's very hard. It's very very hard to just uh, uh, randomly modify things without running afoul of these two principles. And these principles aren't just things that we care about mathematically or for some abstract reason. We care because they work and they've been established by experiment. And uh, and the, the the there's no detected violations of the laws of quantum mechanics. There's no detected violations of the laws of relativity, even though people have looked responsibly looked. You know. Uh, uh, relativity tells you all the particles have the same maximal speed, just to give you an example, which is the speed of light. And people know experimentally that the difference between the speed of light of the proton and the photon, by which I mean the maximal possible speed of the proton and the photon, has to be less than one part in 10 to the 25. Okay? So it's not that these things sort of work at 10% or even you know a few parts in 1,000 or something. They're shockingly, shockingly uh, accurately known. Okay? And these two principles put us in a tremendous straitjacket. So uh, it isn't just new experiments that we have to confront. Of course we have to confront new experiments and hopefully make, uh, try to solve some of the puzzles that face us and make predictions for new experiments. 
But we have a huge job on our hands just not being in conflict with all the old experiments. Okay? And that's the, one of the central messages that I want you to take away from this talk. Uh, one of the sort of central philosophical things, if you like. Because it's a real difference between this part of uh, fundamental physics, this part of science uh, in the theoretical physics, and most of the rest of science. And it's, uh, and it's a reflection of how mature our field is. We've been at this business for, for, for 400 years. Um, and, 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 uh, uh, and so we can't just make stuff up. It's not like I can roll out of bed as a theorist in the morning and say, ha-ha. You see, you might think, uh, you hear stories like the LHC uh, took sort of 50 years to confirm the existence of the Higgs particle after it was hypothesized 50 years ago by Higgs and 10 other people. Okay, So, um, you, so that sounds like a very easy life for a theoretical physicist on, uh, from, from, from one cynical point of view. You say you roll out of bed in the morning, you make crap up. <laughs> Okay? And the experiments won't happen for 50 years. You'll probably be dead anyway. <laughs> you convince someone to give you a job. You know, it's very nice. And there's limps, there's uh, nymphs and dryads and leprechauns around every corner. And you're just making up stuff, right? And until the new experiments come along that might not be in your lifetime anyway, uh, no one will know what's right and wrong. It is not like that. <laughs> Okay? It is not like that because 99.99999% uh, of every idea you have as a theoretical physicist is dead on arrival. Okay? It's dead on arrival not because of waiting for new experiments, but because of being in agreement with all the old ones. Okay, and I want to illustrate this point. So we've, we've seen this already in the context of the, of the Higgs. How, how just, uh, how taking these principles seriously, uh, led us to correctly predict the existence of, of, of the Higgs. So now what I want to do is turn to some of the 21st century frontiers and, um, and tell you what some of the mysteries are and show you, uh, some of this, uh, uh, way of operating, um, in theoretical physics, uh, a little bit in action. Okay. So, there are two main frontiers. Uh, they may end up being related to each other. Um, uh, so let's talk about uh, the first one first. Uh, Space-time is doomed. What replaces it? So uh, why is space-time doomed? Well, <clears throat> here's a little thought experiment that, that, that we can do. Uh, we can try to see what's going on in some little region of space and time, like this little region of space and time. How do we do it? Well, I'm going to look to see What's there? I'm going to use a magnifying glass. That's my terrible artist representation of a, mat, uh, uh, of a magnifying glass. And I'm going to look in some little region of space just to see what, what, what's there. I want to measure some separation in time or space. Now, again, because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, in order to probe shorter and shorter distances, you need higher and higher energies. Nothing wrong with that, especially if you can convince multinational governments to spend billions of dollars and give you large accelerators that, that allow you to do this, okay? Nothing conceptually wrong with it. And if you want to go to shorter distances, you need higher energies. But at some point, something bad happens because of gravity. At some point, you have to put so much energy into such a tiny region of space that because E equals mc squared, it's like you're putting a huge amount of mass in this little region of space. And what do you know happens when you put enough mass in a tiny region of space? It collapses into a black hole, right? Now, black holes, by definition, mean the information from what's inside cannot possibly get out. So you're trying to see what's going on in there, and for your efforts, you're rewarded by making a black hole that makes it impossible to see what's going on inside, okay? So that's something else that sucks, okay? <laughs> But, uh, but, uh, but unlike the other thing that may have sucked with the 12 particle uh, interactions, this one actually happens. Okay? At least we have no reason to expect it doesn't happen. Now, let's say you're frustrated by this. Say, damn it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build an even high energy accelerator, more powerful uh, magnifying glass. What happens? Make an even bigger black hole. Okay? So this whole sort of reductionist paradigm that we go to shorter and shorter and shorter distances, and that's where everything is fundamentally given to us, breaks down at some point. And in fact, really high energies correspond to longer and longer distances again. When does that happen? If you put in the numbers, it happens at a distance scale of around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. This is ridiculous. It's uh, you know, 16 orders of magnitude smaller than the distances we're probing at the LHC. It's a really small distance. Okay. But we can do this thought experiment, and we see that simply the existence of gravity, together with quantum mechanics, again, it's the uncertainty principle that forces us 
to build, uh, to use higher energies to probe shorter distances means that there's no experiment we can even in principle do that could probe distances and times that are short compared to these famous scales. So they're called the Planck length and the Planck time. Now the energy to get to these huge scales is 17 orders of magnitude higher than the energies that we have at the LHC, which are uh, you know around a thousand times or 10,000 times the mc squared of the proton. These are more like 10 to the 19 the mc squared of a proton. So it's really huge. The really the fact that the energies are huge or the distances are tiny is one of the reflections of the great weakness of gravity compared to all the other uh, interactions. All right. Now, here's another avatar of the same problem. Okay, so it's the same problem over and over again. Uh, sorry, I didn't finish the, 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 uh, uh, the punchline. We can't even in principle measure distances and times that are, that are smaller than this Planck length. Now, every time this has happened to us in physics before, where there is some concept we can't even in principle give operational meaning to, those concepts have ended up being approximate. <laughs> They're not truly fundamental. They're not part of the correct uh, description of nature. Okay? Despite the fact, for all practical purposes, in everyday life, it might not make a difference. So when we learned about quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle, we, we learned that we couldn't talk about the position and velocity of a ball at the same time. Despite the fact that I can ask the question, what is the position and velocity of a ball in the English language, uh, or any language, it's not a meaningful question about the world. Okay? Similarly here, we're learning that there's nothing meaningful that we can ask about distances and time. So, but now the thing that we have to lose is space-time itself. Okay, that's very startling. It's very hard to imagine what that might even mean. Physics has changed a lot in 400 years, but one thing it's always been about is describing how things move in time and vary in space. Okay? Those are the ideas that we now have to lose because they're unlikely to be uh, fundamental. We can't give them uh, precise meaning. Here's another avatar of the same problem. So if I take the stick figure interaction involving gravity with two electrons banging into each other, for example, then there is some, the world is quantum mechanical, so I can't predict exactly what happens, but I can predict some probability for something to happen. So the two electrons uh, could, because of the force of gravity, uh, they could scatter and they could come off at some angle, or they could come off at some other angle. And uh, in principle, there is a probability, if they come in like this, that they come out at 10 degrees or 27 degrees. And there's just a different probability for all those different angles that could come out. And they, of course, they'd better add up to one, because probabilities add up to one. Okay, so in quantum mechanics, the probability for these things to happen is called the probability amplitude. Uh, it's a square of something called the probability amplitude. And you can just work out that exactly this, uh, exactly this uh, exchange of a graviton between two electrons, that if it was a force, would give you something that goes like G Newton times the mass of the two electrons. Here, since we're at really high energies, instead of the mass, we have the energy of the electrons. And it's a probability amplitude that grows like Newton's constant times the energy squared. Instead of mass times mass, it's like energy times energy. So this is the probability amplitude that when the energies are small compared to this famous Planck energy is absolutely minuscule. But if you keep extrapolating it when the energy is large compared to the Planckian energy, this amplitude gets bigger than one. That's meaningless. That means that the theory that we have, that this theory that was so fantastic and is fixed by all these deep principles at long enough distances, if I extrapolate to really high energies and short distances, predicts nonsense. Okay, it predicts the probabilities cannot possibly add up to one. Okay, they start being bigger than one. They can't be bigger than one. That means that this formula can't be right. Something has got to be modified. Okay, so there are yet other uh, avatars of exactly the same problem. If we uh, extrapolate the universe back in time, um, uh, things get more and more dense, hotter and hotter. All the curvatures involved get larger and larger. And there is a time when the curvatures become comparable to this Planck distance, Planck time. Right around then, that's what we often call the Big Bang singularity. People sometimes ask what happened at the Big Bang or what came before the Big Bang. And that's very likely that's another one of the questions that can be phrased in the English language but is not a meaningful question about the universe. Because it's a notion of time that's breaking down near the Big Bang. <laughs> Okay? Space and time are breaking down near the Big Bang. The word before may not make sense anymore near, near the Big Bang. But that gives, you a, uh, that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the challenge that, that we're up against. We have to figure out how to replace words like that. 
Analogous things happen if you jump into a black hole. You encounter a singularity that looks rather similar to a Big Bang singularity. In fact, it looks like a universe. When you jump into a black hole, you experience something very much like a crunching universe. Uh, and you're inevitably sucked towards a place where things crunch. Um, and you have exactly the same issues. So it all has to do with the fact that incredibly high energies, incredibly short distances, or notion of space and time are breaking down. Now, I want to give you a little taste of what the life of a theoretical physicist is like uh, to, to illustrate this, um, uh, this, this, this tension and, and the straitjacket that, that we're in, and to introduce a subject that you've probably all heard about in a million venues from, from other points of view, but perhaps in an unfamiliar way. So bear with some of these equations. They won't actually matter uh, in any detail. I'm just uh, writing them down just so you see how incredibly concrete everything is. So here's the first challenge in putting together quantum mechanics and gravity. Okay, uh, this, this issue that we're talking about. We alluded to it already, that if we talk about these uh, probability amplitudes, where the particles are banging into each other, these amplitudes become large. Okay? They become bigger than one, and that's in conflict with the idea that the probability should add up to one. Okay, so a first simple challenge is to take some, some, some process. Here is the amplitude for, uh, for two gravitons to hit each other and come out as two other gravitons in some other angle. Okay? It's something that we can calculate using these uh, basic principles. And I'm writing it down. You don't need to know what this means. Just so you see, there's a simple, concrete formula. Okay? These variables, s, t, and u, are just some measure of the energies involved. Okay? So it's a simple, concrete formula. And this is exactly the same, which is perfectly makes sense when these energies are low compared to the Planck scale. But if we extrapolate it to very high energies, when this s, t, and u, and these numbers become very big, it breaks down. It can't make sense. The amplitudes become too large. The probabilities become bigger than one, and it doesn't make any sense. So here's a concrete challenge. Change the formula. Simple. Okay. I want to change the formula, and I want to change it in such a way that when I go to really at very low energies, it's the same as it was before, because I know it works. But at very high energies, I have to change it. And I want to change it so it never gets too big. Right? Simple. Very good. So, okay, this is easy peasy, right? All we do is we take the formula and we multiply it by some function that just is one when all the energies are very low and just gets much smaller than one when all the energies are very high. Okay, and I've written down a very simple example. Again, you don't need to look at it in any detail if you don't like staring at little algebra, but I want to show you again simple concrete things. Very good, we're done. Okay, this is great. You pat yourself on the back. It feels really good. You've solved quantum gravity. Um, it might bother you that uh, uh, you see what I've done here is is I've just added a factor when, the, when these numbers are very small. I can just ignore them, and so these things all look like one. But when they're really big, uh, they these are one over really big numbers. Okay, so that makes that makes the uh, amplitude much smaller than it was before, and everything can be hunky dory and consistent. Very good. So. Now, it might bother you a little bit that, oh, I solved the problem, and someone else could have come along and say, no, I want to square this factor. Okay, that's another, that, that's another choice. It sounds like there's a humongous number of different possibilities for fixing up the theory as you go to really high energies. Right? And if it was like that, then it is like inventing nymphs and dryads and leprechauns around every corner, because we, we're not going to get up to those energies anytime soon. The energies where all the stuff is happening, where all the stuff needs to be relevant, is near this Planckian energy scale. We're not going to build accelerators going up there. So isn't this a completely pointless thing to spend your time on? Right? Uh, until we do experiments going on up there, who cares? There's probably a zillion possibilities for what's going on, and you can dream about them all day long, but until experiments can go up there, why bother thinking about it? And had it been that this thing worked, that would have been a completely legitimate attitude. <laughs> okay? Because you could do a five million things like this, and you can't tell any of them apart. Okay? Until you, if you could, until you do experiments with those very high energies. However, something amazing happens which is that this formula turns out actually not to work, because okay? it violates the laws of quantum mechanics. It violates the laws of quantum mechanics. Now, this is a little bit more subtle, but something that, uh, something that, 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 that you know. Uh, you see, uh, uh, along the way, um, when this thing, uh, before it makes everything small, there is some value at which this becomes equal to 1, 
and this is now something that looks like 1 over 0. So the amplitude is becoming really large in some neighborhood. Now, that, it turns out, by itself isn't so bad. Amplitude is becoming large is something that in other familiar situations you're used to. It's resonance, right? So when you're pumping something at exactly the right frequency, the amplitudes can become larger and larger. And these, when these uh, resonances take place, you have to be, you have to, uh, they have a good interpretation. They have, the inter they have the interpretation that you're colliding these gravitons in and they actually produce some elementary particle. <laughs> they actually directly produce some uh, elementary particle, then travel some distance and it decays back to the other two gravitons. But then you have to be able to interpret what happens in the vicinity where this thing becomes large as exactly that, the production of a particle that then travels some distance and decays. That tells you something very specific. I don't have time to explain what it is, but it tells you that this function in the neighborhood of uh, these places where it blows up has to have very specific coefficients uh, turn out to be positive numbers. Those positive numbers give you the probabilities for producing these particles. Okay? So there's some positivity that you have to check when you make uh, a guess like this. And you can show this one violates it. It has negative probabilities. Okay? It's worse than the probabilities not, not adding up to one. Well, it's basically the same thing. It has negative probabilities. So you made a guess. Guess is wrong. Without a single experiment at the Planck scale, uh, at these high energy scales, because it violates just the basic laws of quantum mechanics. Very good. Now you say, OK, maybe that didn't work. You square it. You cube it. You try 15 things in the numerator and the denominator. None of them work. In fact, after a little while, you prove there is no such formula which has just a bunch of factors downstairs and upstairs, the finite number of factors upstairs, the finite number of factors uh, downstairs that works. They all have negative probabilities. Amazing. So this is a, I'm going through this just so you get uh, a sense for what our lives are like. Okay? So you go from thinking the thing is easy to thinking it's impossible. This is the standard, <laughs> this is the standard, uh, standard path. And you prove theorems, and it's impossible. And, and then you say, well, God knows. It's something, uh, you know, uh, let's just give up. And then what happens is that someone comes along and writes down this formula. <laughs> okay? And again, you don't need to know what any of these symbols mean. I'm just, again, writing it down to see it fits on a line. It's something very simple. These little funny symbols, gamma, are, there's a special function. It's called the gamma function. It's like the, the factorial you might be familiar with in high school. So the gamma function, the gamma of 7 would be the number 6 factorial. And there's some way of extending the notion of a factorial away just from uh, integers. Okay? So now, someone comes up with this formula. And this is not exactly how the history happened, but it's more or less, it's not far from how the history happened. Okay? So this is, this is, this is the formula which does everything that it's supposed to do. It, it uh, solves a problem with the probabilities becoming large. And when you check to see whether the probabilities involved for producing the particles are positive, it's absolutely miraculously positive. <laughs> okay? it, so, so it's a total miracle. Okay? And that's basically what happened. Okay? People uh, came up with uh, this uh, formula. And now the job, uh, so, so this is, of course, very exciting. Um, and uh, when you see something miraculous, you don't sit around thinking how miraculous it is all day. Uh, you try to understand what makes it not a miracle. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, um, and that's what actually happened. People stared at this formula for five years, and they eventually realized where it came from and what explained it. And what explained it was a picture that the gravitons weren't little point-like particles, but they're little loops of string. Okay? So this is the birth of string theory. Now, often when you hear the story of string theory, it's told in some very opposite ahistorical order. That wouldn't it be cool if instead of having point-like particles, things were little loops of string? And then there's violins, and you know, there's uh, all this elegance and beauty, and all of this sort of stuff, which makes it sound like a total like fashion. You know, it's like an aesthetic sense, I think little loops are pretty, right? Uh, and look how nice it all turned out. And it doesn't give you, if you're, if you're a kind of a hard-nosed uh, person, it doesn't give you a feeling, well, you think loops are pretty, I think loops are ugly. <laughs> okay? I want it to be little fractal snowflake shapes. What's wrong with that? <laughs> okay? Or I want it to, uh, you know, you could do any kind of uh, stuff you want. Um, so what's so special about the thing which is a string? Now, the people saying these things aren't, they're not, no one is lying to you. Okay? They're, 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 uh, 
Um, but uh, but there but um, by not telling you uh, the story, I think in uh, in the historical context, they are depriving you of a, of a very deep fact. Okay, the very deep fact is that it was not that people imagined there might be little loops of string, but that it was forced on us by seeing this this miracle happen. Okay, and it's not sociology. It's not uh, whether you're in the club of people who like loops versus little fractal shapes, okay? There's a concrete thing. Can you write down a formula that works or not? That, you know, now, of course, that works means compatible with the basic principles. In order to check whether this formula is right, we'd have to do experiments, very difficult experiments, build accelerators the size of the galaxy, and go out to these very high energies to see all this stuff happen. So. The fact that we found one formula that works doesn't mean that it's the only formula that works. But I can tell you that in the 50 years that people have been thinking about this question, they have not found a second formula that works. Okay? And if you find a second formula that works, um, you'll be you know, a rock star in theoretical physics overnight. <laughs> has nothing to do with sociology. It has nothing to do with uh, what club you're in. It's that we have these very, very tight... Uh, um, uh, things that we have to satisfy, and uh, and when we find so that means that it's possible to have a strategy for approaching these questions that goes in two steps, and it's true for our part of science and uh, hardly for any other part. First, you try to find candidate things that even could work, and if you find a few of them, then you study the heck out of them. You try to see all the possible ways you could probe them experimentally, uh, and then you prepare yourself and your experimental friends as much as possible to look for the very few set of possibilities there are that can attack some of these questions. Okay. Now, this turns out to be, I don't have very much time left, and I want to tell you a little bit about the second set of questions uh, 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 before I end as well. Don't worry, we won't be going with uniform time for the rest of the slides. <laughs> um, but uh, the, but uh, I've, I've stressed a very old-fashioned aspect of putting together quantum mechanics and gravity, a very old-fashioned aspect of uh, string theory. Um, uh, one of the most exciting things that's happened in the last 20 years in theoretical physics is the realization that, that these pictures of particles as little loops of strings are actually not as distant from the old point particle picture of fundamental particles and interactions as people thought at first. And they're, in fact, different descriptions of the same underlying set of ideas. So you can't actually separate in any meaningful way a discussion of the way elementary particles interact with each other and the interactions of these little loops of string. So they're all part and parcel of this one much larger set of questions about uh, what it takes to put together relativity and quantum mechanics. It's just a vastly richer set of ideas and, uh, uh, than, than anyone realized, and, uh, and we're learning how to think about it more and more as time, as time goes on. So there's a few other things that I wanted to say about that, but let me move on. Uh, uh, let me move on. I'll even ignore the speculation uh, to, the, to, to tell you a little bit about the second set of questions. Uh, the second set of questions uh, um, is, uh, has to do with the question, why is the universe big? Why is there a macroscopic universe? And here, let me illustrate the problem uh, in, in, uh, in, in a very simple way. Um, it, once again, everything has to do with these quantum mechanical fluctuations in the vacuum, these, these quantum mechanical fluctuations which get more and more violent as you go to shorter and shorter distances. These were what were responsible for the doom of space-time in the first part of our previous discussion. And they're also basically responsible for, uh, for why we don't understand the existence of a macroscopic universe, roughly speaking, because you have very violent quantum fluctuations, more and more violent as you go to shorter and shorter distances. So if that's the case, if there are these roiling, violent fluctuations, why do we have an orderly universe on very, very long distances? One aspect is that even the vacuum has energy due to these quantum mechanical fluctuations uh, in, in the vacuum. If you imagine you have a ball at the end of, of a string, in a classical world, it would have zero energy. But quantum mechanically, you can't both know that it's a bottom and that it's not moving. So it always has some jitter. Okay? There's a minimum amount of energy associated with it, and the size of that energy is this famous Planck's constant times the frequency of the oscillations of the pendulum. So the same principle applies if we look at uh, just the fluctuations of particles and antiparticles out of the vacuum. So if I take a box and I ask, 
uh, the, the, the energy contained in the quantum mechanical fluctuations of particles and antiparticles in the box, well, the size of the typical fluctuation would be given by, uh, would be set by the wavelength of the, of the, of the particles that would fit in that box. And as you make the box smaller and smaller, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter, the frequencies are higher and higher, the energies are bigger and bigger, so this minimum amount of energy in the vacuum is getting bigger and bigger doubly. It's getting bigger because these individual guys are, have higher and higher energies, and, uh, and the energy density, the energy per unit volume, is, is, is getting even bigger still because the box is getting smaller and smaller. Okay, so we can do this estimate for the energy density in the vacuum. This has, uh, it's called a famous quantity. It's called the cosmological constant. It's uh, denoted by this uh, uh, letter, a big, Greek letter, big lambda. This vacuum energy density is the energy in this box divided by the volume in the box, the energy in the quantum jitter in this box divided by the volume of the box. And, well, naively, it's infinite, because if I make the box arbitrarily tiny, the energy is infinite, the volume is zero, so this energy density, uh, the energy per unit volume is infinitely large. Well, surely it can't be infinite, because we just talked about how space and time and everything break down when we get to the, to the Planck scale, so I can't make the box too, too small. So let me do this estimate somewhere. I'll stop somewhere. I'll stop, let's say, ten times bigger than the uh, Planck length, or somewhere around the Planck length. So the energy density that I get is Planckian. Every word here is Planck. It's a Planck energy over a Planck volume. Now, what does that energy in the vacuum do? The energy density in the vacuum. Well, energy, again, E is like E, in a, e equals mc squared. So having a lot of energy there is like having a lot of mass. And mass gravitates. Einstein taught us that, uh, that what mass does is curve space and time. So this thing is going to curve space and time. But it's not like having a planet there that curves things more in the vicinity of the planet and less as you go far away from the planet. This energy is there everywhere, so it's going to curve space and time everywhere. So what's the typical curvature associated with this? We don't need to have any, any equations or any calculations because only one word appears on the slide other than the other words, Planck. Okay, everything is Planckian. Okay, so the only possible answer that we could get is a Planckian curvature. That means that this amount of energy density should, for example, curve the universe up to be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters big. Or it could make the universe expand, but it can make it sort of double in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Okay? That is not our world. Okay? That is very, 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 very far from our world. Now, a theoretical physicist is supposed to estimate anything in the world and get the right answer to a factor of 10. Okay, and um, and that's it's 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 typically true, um, and you know sometimes we don't even estimate things, so we can calculate these quantities that agree between theory and experiment routinely to a part in a hundred or a part in a thousand, sometimes to talk to twelve decimal places. Those are our standards. So we take it very personally indeed when we do a back of the envelope estimate, and we get an answer that is so radically, vastly, massively wrong. Okay. I used to call this the biggest error in the history of physics, uh, in, the, in the history of uh, physics, and I realized that was insulting to other sciences, uh, assuming they had made a bigger error. It's the biggest error in the history of science. It's the biggest error, uh, the difference between the back of the envelope estimate and reality uh, we've ever encountered. So what do we do? So, so in other words, this energy density in the vacuum that we just estimated in the simple way should curve space you know, vastly, vastly more. Should curve it to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters big, even though our universe is 10 billion light years big. Okay? So what do we actually have to do? This is what we do. This is what we actually do. We say, well, it's, it's actually okay. What we just talked about here is some quantum mechanical correction. Let's say in Planck units, there's some quantum mechanical correction to the energy of the vacuum. So again, we ask these kind graduate students to come with their food, or we give them food even better, okay, for this. And we say, please calculate what this quantum correction to the vacuum energy, uh, uh, to the cosmological constant is, and they work, and they work, and they work, and they find us 2.6493781, they, they, they keep on going. And they calculate it to 120 decimal places. We say, thank you very much for your hard work. Uh, what must be going on is this. There is actually, there can't be this big energy in the vacuum that would curve the universe so much. It must have been that there was another piece sitting there already just from classical physics, not from this quantum mechanical correction, just from classical physics. And what was its size? Its size was minus 
2.6, you peek at what they said, thank you very much, minus 2.6, dot, dot, dot. And you've got to go 120 decimal places and make a disagree in the 121st decimal place. Okay? So that's what we actually do today. The only thing that we don't do is employ the graduate students to do that because it wouldn't be very nice. No matter what they did, we would say, ah, it's the other thing. And they agree to 120 decimal places and we make it disagree in the 121st. That's our answer to the question, why is the universe big? Okay? So when I told you we have big problems, uh, we have big problems, right? There's, it should be clear there's nothing inconsistent with this. We're allowed to do this, right? No, no one stops us from doing it. We can do this, we can make a big universe, and then we can do and do all the other wonderful things uh, that I told you. Um, uh, so once you condition on there being a big universe out there and the massless particles and all the rest of it, we can do all the other wonderful stuff, but we don't understand where the starting point came from to begin with. <laughs> okay. And so what we have to do is imagine these ridiculous fine adjustments uh, uh, between totally different uh, parameters in our theory uh, in order to be able to explain this. For obvious reasons, this is called fine-tuning. It's like walking into a room and seeing a pencil standing on its tip balanced to within 10 to the minus 120 degrees of vertical. <laughs> okay? It's possible. But if you saw it, you would probably think that something is up. Right? Uh, maybe you'd look for a string hanging from the ceiling. Right? Maybe you'd look for a little hand. Is there a little hand holding it up? Right? You would not just leave it alone and say, well, just is, is, it is what it is. Right? <laughs> All right. So now, that's, our, uh, that's the problem we have associated with why is the universe big. And we have a very similar problem associated with the Higgs particle. Okay? Now here too, uh, th there's a way of describing this in terms of these big, giant quantum mechanical fluctuations, but I want to emphasize another way of, uh, of uh, talking about it. Uh, the Higgs particle uh, has a mass. We produce it at the Large Hadron Collider, right? So, uh, so the typical length scales associated with it Length cells that we needed to probe to produce it were, you know, 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, a thousand times smaller than the nucleus of the atom. Um, but why don't all these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations in the vacuum, these Planckian violent quantum fluctuations in the vacuum, um, why don't they uh, make it? Uh, uh, why don't they? Why don't they mean that as the Higgs is going through, uh, as propagating through the vacuum, it's just bouncing into all these things all the time, and that should give it a huge inertia? You would think it would give it an enormous mass much, much, much larger than the, than, than, than the mass that we observe. It would be jiggled so much that in order to be able to see it, you'd have to res resolve Planckian distances, not these uh, much larger distances, which are still very, very small, but the, but the uh, distances that we managed to probe at the LHC. So that's part of a more general question. Uh, why the, the, the particles that we have, these, uh, then in the approximation, we want to think about them as, as a massless. Uh, why are they massless? Why don't they have an enormous mass very, very close to the Planck scale? Or some other very, very uh, high energy scale? Well, for particles like photons, we have a very good answer to this question. Uh, a photon is exactly massless, and there's a simple reason why it's exactly massless. Even though as it's moving around, you might think it could have all these violent interactions with all these quantum mechanical fluctuations that, 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 that could be going on, but it can't give the photon a mass. And it can't give the photon a mass for exactly the reason that we talked about earlier in the talk, that a massless photon has two degrees of freedom, while a massive photon would have three. So these little interactions can't just give birth to an extra state that wasn't there. Okay? So two is not equal to three, and that's why photons can be massless. This logic applies to all the elementary particles with spin, but it fails for the Higgs particle. It fails for the Higgs for precisely the reason why the Higgs was so novel and exotic and exciting. Uh, the Higgs has spin zero. And there is no difference in the number of degrees of freedom between a massless particle of spin zero and a massive particle of spin zero. So we have no good understanding for why it is that the Higgs particle, by interacting with all these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations, isn't dragged up to vastly, gargantuanly higher masses than what we actually observed. And this problem is a very close cousin of the question of why the universe is big. Here, instead of finally adjusting, what we, we do it. We do it in our equations. We make predictions. We can calculate with the Higgs. But here, we only have to 
make adjustments in the 32nd decimal place. <laughs> it's not as bad as 120, but it's bad, <laughs> right? So to explain very basic things about our world, why is the universe big? And even though I had time to explain it, um, uh, this question of, of, of why the Higgs is where it is is related to why uh, the universe is not only big, but it has large things in it. It's related to the weakness of gravity, which ultimately explains why the universe has big things like planets in it, even though it's made out of uh, uh, atoms and um, and, uh, and the molecules, to explain why the universe is big and has big things in it, we have to adjust things ultimately to 150 decimal places. Okay, uh, And this does not seem like a satisfactory explanation. Okay, so um, uh, I'll just take two minutes to, to just uh, uh, give you a, a sense for how we can proceed um, by the same lines that were, that were successful in the past. Once again, we have a set of mysteries. Once again, we can ask, is there anything that the universe can do compatible with general principles that we have not yet seen it do? And there's the last thing that the universe can do with compatible, uh, with general principles that we have not seen it do, which is to say that there's a particle of spin three halves. It turns out that it's possible to have particles of spin three halves, but only if your theory is a very special property. It has to have something known as supersymmetry. And this doubles the world. It means that for every particle that we know, for example, particles like electrons, there has to be a partner particle uh, that has a different spin. It's a lot like when we discovered antimatter. When we discovered antimatter, we doubled the world. <laughs> And, uh, and, and uh, to have something like supersymmetry, you also have to double the world. I don't have time to explain it, but this doubling of the world is associated with an enhancement of our picture of what space-time itself is. In a sense, we make space-time a little bit more quantum mechanical. Um, we imagine in addition to the ordinary dimensions of space that we have, we have other directions. But those other directions aren't just like our directions. The distance in those other uh, in those other directions aren't measured by ordinary numbers, but they're measured by numbers that make sense uh, when you have quantum mechanics, but don't make sense purely in a classical uh, picture of the world. So with this addition to our picture of space-time, um, it turns out to be possible to explain why these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations go away. Uh, and there's, there's a very pretty story associated with that, but I don't have time uh, to explain it. Um, so that is a candidate, at least for the question of why the Higgs is where it is. It is a candidate for, um, for, uh, for, uh, for explaining it. Again, we have very, very few things uh, at our disposal. In the 30 years that people have been thinking about this problem, they've found basically two explanations for what could be like a little hand that holds up the pencil. Okay, some, some reason why these violent jitters are removed by some mechanism, by some new dynamics, by some new picture. And supersymmetry is one of the two uh, explanations that people have come up with. It's the more interesting of the two kinds of uh, explanations. Now, um, we can look for these supersymmetric particles at the Large Hadron Collider. They need to show up right around the energies where we discovered the Higgs. They can't show up 100 times later, because then these violent jitters involving the Higgs would have taken it up to where they are. <laughs> okay, They need to remove these big jitters right around where the Higgs is itself. People have known this for 20 years, 30 years, since we've been thinking about supersymmetric theories. There's lots of uh, specific signals and ways that you could be looking for them in collisions at the LHC. They haven't been seen yet. Okay, And um, it's disquieting that they haven't been seen yet. Uh, it was disquieting that, that they weren't seen 20 years ago, to be completely honest. And it wasn't massively disquieting, but it was somewhat disturbing. It got more disturbing that we didn't see them 10 years ago at previous experiments before the LHC, um, 15 years ago. Even more disturbing that we don't see them in the first one of the LHC. It doesn't mean yet that they're not there. It's not quite at the point where we have to uh, give up on this idea, at least for explaining uh, the, the, the question of why the Higgs is there. But it's certainly the 11th hour for this, uh, um, uh, for this particular uh, picture. And that's one of the very important things that we're, we're going to experimentally learn at the LHC. Is this idea, or any other idea like this, is there something out there that's removing the violent jitters associated with the Higgs, or not? Um, and we don't know. We haven't seen anything yet. We'll either see something, supersymmetry, something else, whatever it is, or we won't. 
If we see something, fantastic. We'll spend a long time trying to figure out what this thing is. If we don't, it'll be an even bigger paradigm shift. Okay? It'll be something that theorists expect it to be true for 30 years. We'll not see it from nature. And I think the last time something of this magnitude happened was when theorists expected to see the ether at the end of the 1800s, and we didn't see the ether. Okay? The ether was not a stupid idea. It was a fantastic idea. Uh, it was wrong. Uh, it led the way to many correct ideas that, that, that came after that. But if it ends up being wrong, if this end up, idea ends up being wrong, if there's nothing removing these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations, we're learning something very deep about the way the world works, something hardwired into the basic structure of space-time, quantum mechanics, and the vacuum. And there's something about it that we will not, that we still do not understand. Okay? And so we haven't seen anybody yet. We might see uh, somebody soon in this coming run of the uh, uh, current run of the LHC. Um, or we might not, and that's, that's what makes research exciting. We don't know what the answer uh, to this question is. Now, there has been an elephant in the room for the last 30 years, which is that exactly the same arguments that we've spent uh, talking about, removing these jitters for the Higgs and things like that, and predicting that we should see supersymmetric particles at the LHC and so on, exactly the same arguments could have been applied to the question of the energy density of the vacuum. And there, they would have made a prediction that you should see new particles and new physics at around the length scale of a millimeter. Okay, because that's the length scale that turns out to be associated with the size of the vacuum energy. And that is an experiment that you don't need a big collider to do. We can all, you know, look, stare down and see there's no new physics at the millimeter scale. Okay? So these jitters associated with the energy density of the vacuum are not being removed. And yet, the, the world is not curved uh, at ridiculously tiny distances. So something is different, at least, about the vacuum energy. Um, uh, and, and it could be that, that this is already an early indication that, that, uh, that there's something else at work and something else that we still don't uh, uh, deeply understand. That has something to do with cosmology, faraway things, difficult to probe experimentally. Uh, the Higgs is something much more direct, much more under our, uh, uh, our control, something we can experiment on, something we can study, something we can, we, we can hit and measure. And, uh, and it could be, if we don't see any evidence for anything other than the Higgs at the LHC, that uh, both of these things are pointing in the same direction, and there's something deep about the dynamics of space-time, as I said already, space-time, quantum mechanics, and the vacuum that, 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 that we don't... Uh, that we're missing. So these are two things that we've talked about in the crises of the 21st century. We have to get rid of space-time and have it emerge from more primitive building blocks, and even to understand uh, why there is a macroscopic universe, uh, uh, we, we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, these deep paradoxes that we have to face. So we're clearly missing something huge about the quantum mechanics of our, of our relativistic vacuum. And uh, I, I advertise it in the abstract for the talk, but I don't have time to uh, talk about it, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, I'll just say that uh, of these two, uh, of, of these questions, we, we can uh, we can try to hit um, uh, the thing that is under our experimental control more than anything else is the study of the Higgs. Okay, uh, it's, the Higgs is the most important character uh, in this in this mystery. Um, uh, because, because, it, because it's something that uh, we can put under a microscope and study. Okay? Uh, the mysteries associated with it are, are completely parallel to the mysteries associated with, the, uh, with the, why the universe is large, with the, with the uh, vacuum energy. Um, but because we've never seen an elementary particle like it, we've never seen an elementary spin zero particle, um, and, uh, and remember, the fact that it has spin zero is exactly what made it susceptible to these big, jittery, violent fluctuations in, in the vacuum. What we have to do is put it under a microscope and study it and see, is it really point-like? Is it really elementary? And uh, we can do many experiments on it and try to see um, uh, if there's something about the properties of these quantum fluctuations in the vacuum that, uh, uh, that we'll understand better or we can probe um, from more powerful experiments. And this is going to need a machine beyond the Large Hadron Collider. 
Uh, the LHC was fantastic. It is fantastic. It's continuing. It's producing lots and lots of, uh, of, uh, of data. We're looking for lots of uh, uh, new physics beyond the Higgs. But one thing that we're not going to get from the LHC, even if we finish running it to the end of its lifetime, is a much sharper picture of the Higgs particle itself. Okay, we're going to get a relatively, we're going to see that it's somewhat elementary, but not that it's really, really super duper point like. Okay? What we'd like to do is put it under a powerful enough microscope to see, does it really composite? Does it, have like, is it, does it have a size, like protons and neutrons and other things like that sort of have a size? Or is it truly elementary? Is it much more point-like than that? And to do that, we're going to need a machine uh, beyond the LHC. And people are talking about uh, machines like this. People are talking about it in Europe. What makes particle physics happier than anything else is a picture of a map of the world with giant rings on it. Okay? And this is a picture of the area around the Geneva again with the little dinky LHC and a potential 80 to 100 kilometer around tunnel. Uh, that machine, uh, in that tunnel, you could collide electrons and positrons and produce millions of Higgs particles, uh, measure the properties of the Higgs to an accuracy 30 times better than you could do at the LHC. And you could also collide protons and go to energies around 10 times higher than the energy of the LHC. And both of these things will be necessary uh, to probe these three things, the, the space-time quantum mechanics vacuum in, in the way they come together in the properties of the Higgs particle and hopefully uh, give us some, uh, uh, some very important experimental clues one way or another to what's going on. Um, and also people are talking about this project in China, where again there's a picture of a map of the world. This area is around 300 kilometers northeast of Beijing, uh, and there's a little 50 kilometer tunnel, a 100 kilometer tunnel. There's room for an even bigger tunnel if you, uh, if you, if you squint. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, so these things are being thought about now. Uh, planning and constructing projects like this takes 20 to 30 years, so it's important to start thinking about them seriously. It's, it's exciting that both uh, Europe and China are starting to think about it seriously. We're very, very far from having them be reality, but they have moved away from the realm of fantasy, and it's something that, uh, that, that serious people are starting to think about. The main issue with uh, any such project is the cost. And they cost 10 billion in your favorite units. <laughs> okay? It doesn't really matter what the units are. <laughs> uh, and the only thing I'll say about this is that the amount that these machines cost has basically been always the same. Okay? Uh, it's true that they're getting more expensive, but the world is getting richer at the same time. Okay? And as a fraction of GDP, they've always been basically the same. So the LHC right now costs around three times uh, 10 to the minus four uh, of the European GDP. God knows what happens after the Brexit, but uh, uh, um, but so it's around three ten to the minus four of uh, GDP. There was a machine in that we were going to build in America, the super, superconducting super colliders. Basically, this machine it was half as big as the thing that we're talking about. We were thinking about making it 40 years ago. Um, uh, so it's sort of really pathetic if we can't do it 50 years afterwards. And that, when it was canceled by, by, by Congress, it was canceled, but, but when it was canceled, it, it cost around 10 to the minus 4 GDP. They always have cost around the same. These machines in Europe and in... The